you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. So everyone, I'm uh, Stefano De Angelis, Research Solution Architect at Algorand, and I'm presenting today the Algorand ABI, and I will show you um, how to write ABI compliant smart contracts with the PyTL. So first of all, what is an ABI? ABI stands for Application Binary Interface, as it's indeed an interface between two components, and uh, two components which are program modules. One of these modules is usually working at the mach machine code level. And this interface defines the convention on how data should be passed between the component and the encoding and decoding of this data. Right, so let me check if I can write. So Algorand ABI is indeed an interface uh, between uh, a client application and the smart contracts in Algorand. And the Algorand ABI defines the way to call smart contracts and also defines the way for encoding and decoding application arguments and the return values we can get from a smart contract. The, the Algorand ABI has been introduced with the ARC4, ARC is Algorand Request for Comments, which is a, a repository of standards held by the, communi the, the, the community, where they discuss about possible improvements uh, or application use cases on the, on the Algorand blockchain. And the ABI has been the result of the ERC4. So this standard defined an approach to call smart contract methods and also introduce this kind of new concept of ABI interface description object, which is a human and machine readable JSON file showing all the methods of a smart contract and the, the required input and return values that the smart contract has. So why the Algorand ABI is important? Well, imagine I'm writing a smart contract. And um, when I write a smart contract, I define the methods. We have seen with Mattel that we have uh, basic types, UN64 and bytes. And my smart contract takes uh, an argument, which is a, a string or a Boolean value. So I need to encode that uh, argument somehow in TL. The problem is that only the smart contract developer knows how the argument has been um, encoded. If we, an external application wants to call that, mascot, that smart contract could be problematic. So now imagine that as a smart contract developer, I can publish somewhere in a repository, an interface showing all the method exposed by, by my smart contract and all the arguments that should be passed to the smart contract. So this would simplify a lot the life of developers and the client application. Uh, allowing the interaction between uh, application and uh, smart contracts indeed. So let's dig into the ABI interface JSON file. So this is an outcome from the ARC4 and the, the standard provides a JSON with the three core type elements, which are called middle, interface and, uh, and contract. So a method is basically uh, the definition of, of, a, of a method in your smart contract and has a name, a description, the, the list of arguments that your smart contract, your method requires, sorry, with types and description, and finally the return value of your, of your method. If we put together a list of methods, we have an interface which defines uh, like the baseline of a ARC compliant smart contract. You can take an interface, you can extend it with the other methods and deploy smart contracts on the blockchain. In that case, you are building a contract indeed, which is a description uh, of a smart contract that currently is deployed in the blockchain. And usually a contract is an extension of an interface. Here, for example, we have a demo smart contract uh, with uh, three methods and uh, this smart contract was deployed on two networks and the, with different application ID. 
So, well, we have this kind of object that can expose uh, client applications, uh, very interesting information about our smart contracts, but still there is some problem when we want to call a method and redirect that interaction on the correct execution branch of your smart contract. And to do so, the ARC4 introduced a standard approach for developers. So first of all, it introduces the concept of method signature, uh, which is a way to identify a method into, into your smart contract. And the, the method signature is composed by the concatenation of the method name, the argument types, and the return type uh, of a method. For example, here we have an add method taking as argument a unit six, two units 64 and returning a unit 128. But this is not enough because after the method signature, ERC4 introduced the concept of selector, which is the first byte of the hash of a signature. So here we have the, the whole hash of the signature and we just take as a selector the first uh, four bytes. And this selector is then used as a actual selector for your smart contract. And the standard says that in your application call, when you call the smart contract, we know that we need to pass parameters, arguments in our application call. And the standard approach says that the first argument of the application call must be the selector. In this way, the smart contract will identify which uh, method you are calling and redirect the execution, the, the correct execution branch. So this is like the basics of uh, the, the ABI introduced uh, with algorithm, uh, with the, within the algorithm machine. But let's take a look now on PyTIL. So how can we build smart contract in PyTIL and ABI compliant smart contract? First of all, with the introduction of the ARC4, the PyTIL has been uh, uh, improved with the support of new, of new type, data types. And also the logic for encoding and decoding these data types into basic uh, uh, TIL types. So we have these three new family of, of the data types, which are basic types, reference types, and the transaction types. And then we also introduced in PyTIL the standardized approach for redirecting uh, application code to the correct method, as we just said, uh, as I said before, and also uh, a way to generate that famous API interface JSON file. So let's dig into the, the three new type families introduced with PyTIL. As I said, we have Two unit, two basic types on the VM stack, which are unit 64 and bytes. With PyTIL, can you, we can now work with other types that are automatically encoded and decoded basic, uh, according to the operations required. So for example, here the, we have the list of new types. There is something interesting like the new ABI Boolean type, which is a basic Boolean value that can be either zero or one, we have static arrays of uh, certain objects T with a dimension N. We have address, so we can define a data type, which is an address, an algorithm address of 32 bytes. And we see here, it's interesting, this is an alias for a static array of bytes uh, with a 32 length. Um, again, we have also the interesting types like strings now, which are dynamic arrays of bytes. And two new families of types like tuple and named tuples. Tuples can be maximum dimension of five, which is a limitation, but we can overcome with this limitation using the named tuple, and we will see it in a bit. So let's work with these uh, new, new data types offered by PyTIL. First of all, when we want to work with a, uh, an ABI type, we need to instantiate that type. And for doing that, uh, PyTIL integrates the ABI make method for the instantiation of a type. Once we have the, the type, the, the object instantiated, we can also set the value, assigning a value to that, to that object. In this exa in example, we are showing uh, how to instantiate um, an address, an ABI address, a Boolean value, a unit 64, and finally a tuple of three elements. 
which are an address again, a Boolean value, and a UN64. Once we instantiated these values in a PyTIL sequence, we can also set the values of these objects. Here, for example, we are setting the transaction sender as the value for my address um, object. We are setting the my Boolean object as an evaluation of this PyTIL expression, checking that, that the fee is equal to zero. Here we are setting uh, the unit 64 to 5000. And finally, this is a way to set to configure a, a tuple just by passing the three objects specified as tuple, tuple objects. We have a setter, so of course we can get, we, we have a getter from these uh, new data types. Basically, when we want to access uh, the value of a data type, of an ABI type, we just can use the get method. In this example, we are getting the address stored into the my address object using the get uh, method. Name a tuple. So this is interesting because, as I said, with tuples, we have a maximum limitation of five elements in a tuple. If we exceed this limitation, the, the compiler will fail. In name tuples, we don't have this limitation. And what is a name tuple? It, it is basically a, a tuple with name elements. And this is inspired by the name tuples uh, in Python. So similarly to Python, when we define a name tuple, we just create uh, a class of tuple extending the ABI name tuple type. And this class needs to um, specify the, the field uh, expresses, expressed in this name tuple. For example, here we have an address and a balance. The fields must be defined with the, the ABI type and encapsulated with this field keyword to determine that these are fields, fields of the name tuple. For the usage, we just instantiate the object and then we use the set for setting the values into the name tuple as we have done with tuples. So we have seen the basic types introduced with the ABI, but there is more, right? So as Matteo introduced you, and uh, also causing as well, with the ABM, when we have an application call, I like to say that we need to pass also the context of where the application call must execute. What does it mean? If I want an application call invoking a method that does some logic with external entities on the blockchain, we need to pass those entities to the blockchain. And this is an optimization because we only give to a certain application call just a little bit of context of what the application call uh, or where the application call should work. In that case, we have the the foreign app arrays uh, element of an application call in which we can define the blockchain entities that we want to, to use in that, in that transaction. For example, we can have uh, accounts for looking up the, the local state. We can define assets because we want to do some operation with an asset or just an application because we want to pass uh, external applications to our application code for any kind of different kind of operation that we would see in a minute. So with PyTL, we now have reference types for this kind of object, and we can use those types uh, as arguments of a method. So we have the ABI account, asset, and application types. So let's work with them, just as an example. Since we did, those are reference types, we can access the information there behind those types. For example, we can access the ID of the object, the object we referenced, or we can access the, the parameters of the object. So in this example, we have a subroutine taking as arguments uh, three reference types, an account showing a user, uh, an ABI asset, and an application. In the logic, we are accessing the address of that account and comparing those address, this address with the creator address of the application defined passed as argument using the method params that retrieves us all the params uh, from that application. Also for the asset, we are just checking the asset ID and uh, that is equal to a certain integer. 
We can do more. For example, we can check the asset holding uh, for an account of a certain asset. And for doing that, we are passing the reference types, account, and asset in our method. And we are checking by the user that the asset holding of a specific asset passed as the reference type uh, has a balance and the balance must be greater to zero. So in that case, we are just checking that the user has some uh, ASA in its balance. Okay, last but not least, new type of uh, transactions. So again, Matteo introduced us a bit. We know we have this concept of the uh, uh, atomic group transactions in which we can put together uh, a few transactions uh, until 16 transactions in a certain group and then execute the group together. We can do more with the ABI because we can reference uh, the transactions uh, in the group of an application code. Of course, when we reference those transactions, we can only reference the transactions happening before the application group, uh, the application code in the group. So this order of transaction must be reflected into the method uh, arguments, and we will see it in a, in a minute. As reference types, so we have um, a new type for each of possible transaction that can, we can uh, trigger uh, on the ADM. For example, we have payment transactions or asset conflict transactions or application calls. All of these transactions include the parameters of the transactions and we can inspect them. For example, so imagine here, we can access the group index uh, of a transaction group. In this example, we have uh, an atomic group of four transactions in which the first transaction is a generic transaction. The second transaction of the group is a payment transaction. The third one is an asset transfer. And the fourth is the application call to that specific method and the, the transaction arts. So by accessing the method of index and group index, we can indeed inspect the which order those transactions are. And here we are just checking that the order is exactly as I, I just described you. Accessing the element, uh, the group index of the transaction as an application code to this method and the single index of each of the transaction passed as reference types. We can do more because for each transaction, we can access the field of that transaction and do some cross checks between the application call and the transaction or other arguments we are passing to a method. For example, here we have um, a, a group of two transactions. One transaction is a payment transaction and it's the first transaction of the group. And the second one is the application call to this method. This application call is passing as an argument, the payment transaction indeed, and uh, an, AB, an ABI account, which is a sender of, uh, which should be the sender of that payment transaction. And we are asserting that into the logic of the method in which we are, we are checking that the payment transaction we are passing, we are getting the sender of that transaction and we are comparing to the sender passed as argument. We are also checking that the, the receiver of the payment is the global, the current application address of that smart contract implementing this method. So very good stuff with the reference types, but there is more with the new BI support because now subroutines can return values. And of course, th these return values enforce the, the logs uh, functionality and of code that Mattel showed you. How does it work? We have a new decorator for a subroutine, which is called ABI return subroutine. And then we have also a new, a new way to uh, define the arguments into the, the method. How does it work? So, well, we have first the arguments of the method. In this case, we just have one argument. It's an ABA account. Then we have a star. And after a star, we define this output keyword. The output keyword can take any of the possible ABI types we have. For example, here we're passing as a return value and UN64. 
In this case, we are creating a balance, a UN64 type, and we are setting to that object the um, value read from the, log, from the local state of the account passed this argument. The balance that then is set as an output value and uh, logged on chain as a return value of this code. Okay, so we know, we understood how we can use these new uh, data types offered by ITIL, but there is more. Uh, I said that we also introduced the way uh, routing of methods has been implemented in Python, and we will see it here. So now with the, the concept of methods, we have um, two subtypes of application code transactions that can be triggered uh, against an ERC4 program. ERC4 program is just a, a program uh, compliant with the uh, Algorand ABI. And again, we have two types of uh, application codes. We have a method call and we have a bar call to the smart contract. In the method call, it's just a, a, an application call to a method that takes arguments and returns some certain value. For the bar call, bar calls are calls to uh, method of the smart contract that don't take arguments and do not return any value on the stack. Bar calls can then then divided, and this is uh, interesting, in two types of bar calls. We can have basic bar calls and bar calls that can be executed in the context of an application theory. So basically, usually a bar call is a, a, a non-competition action, like an opt-in, a close-out, or update, delete smart contract, that we don't need to specify any kind of argument. And in the context of an application create, we can also, as an effect, produce an opt-in, close-out, update, or even a delete. So we have this distinction here. All this family of uh, application codes, method codes, bar codes, are then organized in a new component introduced with PyTIL, which is the router. The router is um, uh, an object in charge of routing the application calls to the correct execution branch of the smart contract. For example, uh, the router will take care of uh, routing the bar calls to the right uh, um, PyTIL expression, and will take care of routing the application calls to methods and encoding and decoding the arguments uh, resulting from uh, the, the execution of a method using the logs as well. But there is more. So how do we work uh, with the router? So basically when we have this mixed set of uh, methods and the application calls and the bar calls, we want to um, take the router delete all of our smart contracts. So for doing that, the router needs to, the, the methods needs to be registered into the, the router. And we have two approaches for doing that. Uh, one approach is for bar calls, and a different approach is defined for, for method calls. Let's dig into the bar calls. So for, for the bar calls, we have this router object, which is initialized. And when we initialize the router object, we define all the bar calls actions we want to achieve in our contract. In this example, we have all the possibilities of the bar calls, like the opt-in, close out, update application, and delete application. An interesting thing about the incomplete actions is that we can define indeed an action, so which is a, a result of that application call, what should, the, should be the effect of the application call. And usually these are subroutines or simple expression, evaluation of expressions. Here we are approving, for instance, opt-in, close out, no on creation. And then indeed we have the call config which is a way to discriminate between these two kinds of application calls. A simple bad call application call, just an opt-in application call, for example, or a non-completion action um, happening in the context of an, of an create. If we go back here, we see that the opt-in is allowed and will approve the execution even on the create on the application create. 
the close out will approve the close out application call only when the close out transaction is triggered against the smart contract and so on. Differently for the methods, we, we have a new way to register methods with the, the router. And to do that, we have uh, a decorator and that can be put on top of the method declaration. This de decorator should indicate the router object plus the method function. And within the method function, again, we can define the call config actions that can be uh, triggered by the method. For example, in this method, we can execute this method either in an OP call or during an opt-in uh, call. The result of a, an opt-in call will be that the method, the method will be executed and the transaction center will also opt-in into the smart contract. Good, we have done. We now have all the, the information required for implementing ERC4 programs. But we lost something, right? Because we talked about a very interesting interface for smart contract uh, building a JSON, and we haven't seen it in, in PyTL. For doing that, we need to compile our PyTL program. And there is a new approach for compiling a PyTL program, of course, within the router. The router can now and now exposes the compiled program method, which generates all the detailed code for the approval and the clear state problem. But it does more because it also auto-generates the contract object, which is basically the, the JSON object representing the whole contract implemented within our router. In this example, we are calling the router compile program, which returns an approval program, a clear state program, and a contract object. object. And then we can take these programs, these objects, and we can dump them to a file. For example, here we dump the contract object to a JSON file as an example of JSON. We can do more because with PyTeal, we now have the concept of doc strings. What does it mean? Well, if you remember in the JSON object, we defined the method of the smart contract with the, arc, the list of arguments of each method. But for each method and for each argument, we had a description. There was no way to populate that description since doc strings. With doc strings, we can now have a hat on top of our logic of each method. And this hat will define the description of the methods in the first line, but also of the arguments. For example, here we have a deposit method, which is registered in a router taking two arguments, a payment uh, transaction and a, a sender ABI account. There is a description for that method and the list of descriptions for each argument passed by the method. The result will be something like that. So when we compile the, router, the, the, the program with the compile program uh, function of the router, we'll, we will obtain a JSON with this kind of uh, uh, method description where we have the, the, the type of uh, arguments into the method name, the name of the methods, and the description defined with the doc string. Very cool. And everything is uh, automatic at completion time. So one missing piece here, when we have the TL source code of our smart contract, we have the JSON, we need to call it, right? So we don't know how to call smart contracts yet. We have two approaches. The first approach is an off-chain approach using either the SDK or the goal command line interface of the algorithm demo. In the first case, has been introduced a new component in the SDK, which is the atomic, atomic transaction composer. Basically, this is an utility for constructing transactions and transaction groups uh, compliant with the ABI methods. And to do so, there are two functions uh, called add transaction and add method call that can help you to compose the, the group of transactions all together. And then the atomic transaction composer will also take care of the execution on chain. On the command line interface, we have two ways for calling the back calls, as I showed you before, because we have 
an application call in the context of an application or either a simple application call to a specific action. Both cases have uh, particular uh, command line uh, uh, options. One is the update and another one is the app with the action desired. Finally, this is new and is just introduced with the new uh, PyTL, uh, with the new ABM upgrade, is the app method call that we can use uh, for, from the command line to, to call a method of the smart contract. We will see in a demo how to use it. Finally, we can also call ARC4 programs from another program. As Matt introduced you, we have the contract contract call. Basically, what we can do from a smart contract, we can trigger an application call transaction toward another smart contract. For doing that, PyTeal has been uh, uh, improved with the inner transaction object, with an inner transaction object, and a method called execute method call. Here is an example. We have the inner transaction, which is called the inner transaction builder. We can execute the method call and the arguments must be the application ID we want to call outside from our context, the signature of the method and the args required by that method. All right, so from theory to practice, now that's it for the ABI uh, theory stuff. And let's see how we can work with that. So for doing so, I want to show you the AlgoBank demo, which is a, a demo available on the documentation of PyTeal. And this is basically the first ARC4 program you, could, you will see today. What is AlgoBank? It's a smart contract, ABI compliant, which acts as a, an escrow for user funds. It's like a bank. This smart contract exposes three methods, a deposit, a get balance, and withdraw methods. We will see now how the code is implemented. I will just dig into the code and, and see all the implementations. But first of all, let me spend a couple of words also on the environment I'm working with. I will have uh, an algorithm sandbox running on my machine. Algorand sandbox is a dockerized environment starting up uh, an algorithm node or even a private network. Uh, locally. We will use the private network version for testing purposes, obviously. And then I will show you also a very nice tool called Dubflow, which is a blockchain explorer working either with public chains of Algorand, but also into it can connect to sandbox environment and private networks. So let's see the demo now. So first of all, I want to show you, this is the, I'm using West code for the ones who asked about ID. And uh, here we have the source code of our algo bank application. First thing that jumps to our eyes is the, the router object here. You should be familiar with that now. The router object will just take care about the bell collections. We will see it in a minute. First, I wanted to go down because I want to show you how we are compiling the program. The program. We have the router object using the compile program, which returns the approval program, clear state program, and the contract object. I'm dumping all these three objects to files just for uh, showing you. So let's take a look at the approval program, which is here. And here you can see that from PyTeal, we obtained at compilation, the teal source code. We also have similarly the clear state program. And finally, we have this amazing JSON, which is the JSON file showing all the methods into our smart contract. We have the deposit method, get balance, and withdraw. All right. So let's take a look at the, at the router. The router is defining the application name, AlgoBank, and the barcodes. Barcodes, we have the application creation here, which is approved uh, on create. We have the opt-in, which is approved again, either on create or by calling the opt-in transaction. And then we have close out and clear state, which are both approved 
on call, so when we are calling that application uh, transaction, and the, the, the action will be evaluated by this uh, expression. Here we have transfer balance to lost, and we have the expression here on top. It's just an alias. This expression is just getting from the application global uh, is storing into a variable called loss the, the remaining balance of the transaction sender. So basically what is going on here is that when I close out my position to the algo bank or just clear my state, algo bank will automatically deposit all the remaining balance I have in my local state on algo bank into the, the variable loss. For the update and delete, we will just uh, assert that the sender is the creator and we will do it in a subroutine. Here we have a subroutine that simply assert that the transaction sender calling that um, bar call, delete and update are the creator of the smart contract. Cool. So our methods, I will go fast here. So we have the deposit method, which is again, you've seen it. So it's registered with the router. We can call it either in an op application call or in an opt-in. The result of the opt-in will be that the transaction sender will also opt-in to the smart contract. Let's see the code of the deposit. We have two arguments of our methods. One argument is a payment transaction. So this reminds us that the deposit uh, method will be executed in the context of an atomic group. And then we have as a second argument, the sender, uh, which is an ABI account. What the, this method does, well, it simply assert, does some assertions on the payment transaction passed here and the sender, we have seen it before. And then if the assertion are successful, this smart contract will put in a, in a local variable of the sender, the, the amount uh, paid with the payment transaction. Here we have the address of the sender, we are storing into a balance variable variable of the sender address, the, 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 payment, the amount in the payment transaction, sorry. Get balance, this is simply a getter. So basically, this is a lookup for the user passed as argument, looking up at the uh, balance stored into the local state of, of that specific user. And this method will return the value into the output keyword, which is a unit 64 ABI type. To do that, we have the set method we have seen before, and we are setting the local get from the user of the, of the keyword balance. Finally, the, the, the withdraw, it's a method that takes two arguments, an amount, which is a unit 64, and a, a recipient, which is a, an ABA account. This method will first of all evaluate that the amount we are passing here for the withdrawal can be withdrawn from the transaction sender. And to do that, we are looking up at the transaction, the balance of the transaction sender, and we are subtracting the amount passed as argument of the method code. If this is successful, then we can proceed with the withdrawal, and the withdrawal will be performed from the smart contract with an inner transaction. So basically, the smart contract has a deposit of algos, and after the approval of this precondition here, the smart contract will trigger an inner transaction, which is a payment transaction toward the recipient address. And the recipient is the user we passed here in reference of a certain amount that we passed here as first argument. Interesting thing is that we are setting the fees to zero because we don't want the smart contract to pay the fees for us. We want to uh, let the clients take care about the fees when calling this method, but we will see it in a minute. So I've done, I've done my own work. So I prepared the field for, for you today. And here we have the, what I've done. First of all, as I said, we are working in a sandbox environment. We are into an Android node. 
running in a testnet. I'm using Google, which is the command line interface for Algorand. And first of all, I inspect the list of accounts present in my node. And I the, 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 the Google command returned me three accounts. I took two of them and I added them into the environment variables, account one and account two, just for simplicity. Because then I wanted to use the source code of the approval and clear state programs in TIR for creating the application on the blockchain. To do that, we have the application create command on Google, in which we have to specify the creator of that smart contract, the approval program, which is the algobank approval.til, here we are, the clear program, which is algobank clear state til, here we are, just generated from the rotor um, compiler. And then we have to give to the command the state schema. Matteo introduced you that for a smart contract, we, we, when we create a smart contract, we also need to define how much state will, will uh, cover on the blockchain. And finally, I also added a, a, a small note here for identification. I triggered the, the transaction on chain. Here we have the ABM trying to compile the, the transaction, executing it, and then transaction was approved at round one. We can take this, which is the transaction reference, and use the DAP flow. If I can do that. Here we are, which is a blockchain explorer. Transaction WH3J. Here we are. So we can inspect the transaction. DAP flow is a very nice uh, explorer with a lot of functionalities, and we will see through the demo how we can use it. So this transaction was an application code transaction, which created a smart contract with application ID1. We also have the source code of the TIL and the clear state. And next thing, we have the node encoded B64 that we see here at the bank. So we deployed our, our application on chain. Now I've done some, let's say, uh, administrative stuff. So I exported the application ID. I then inspected here the application info using the application ID, which returned me all the information of this application, passed as ID. The information are the ID of the application, the application account here, the creator, and so on. The application of account is quite useful for us today because we want to use it in the algorithm use cases. So I exported the application account to an environment variable just for simplicity. And then I founded my application with a minimum balance. Gold Club Send is a way to send a payment transaction with a command line. And then sending from account one to application account a certain amount of 0 0.1 algo. It's just for giving a minimum balance to, to our application. So if we, if we go here, we will see that our application has been, if we go here, we can inspect the transaction and we will see that was a payment transaction of 0 0.1 algo to, from the account one to the application, which is the, the address. All right, so we are now ready for interacting with our smart contract. As I said, we, we have three methods. First of all, we want to test the deposit method. What we need for calling that method? Well, we need a payment transaction, passing as argument, and a sender. First of all, since we need to build a group of transactions, we need to create that payment transaction, which is a payment transaction from an account to the smart contract address. Again, here I have the list of comments for making things faster. So for doing that, I'm using the new command of the command line method. With, the, this, with this command, we are just calling an application method, passing the application ID, and also the method signature. We can compute the method signature just looking at the JSON file here. We have the signature composed by the method name, the arguments types, and the return value. Here we are, we compose the method signature. And now we need to pass the arguments here. 
But wait, we have a problem. What's the problem here? We don't have the payment transaction. So this transaction will fail if we execute it because we haven't passed the correct payment transaction on chain. So what we will do, we will first create a payment transaction from an account toward the, the, the smart contract. And for doing that, we have a comment here, which is again, goal, clerk, send. You should be familiar with that now. From the account number two to the application account. I'm just sending one algo to the application account, but bear in mind, bear with me. I'm not executing the transaction. I'm just outputting the transaction to our file. We can execute it. And now we have the transaction the file. So now we can call the method we had before. So this is the deposit method with a payment transaction and an account as argument, where the, the first argument is indeed the payment transaction we just created on a file. And the second argument is a, an account, and uh, it's our account too. We are sending this application call, well, this method call to from, a, from account two. And here we are also setting the on completion to opt-in. So this means that when we execute the deposit, we are here. We are calling an opt-in as a on completion of this method. We call it. And that's it. This blockchain is very fast because we are running in a dev mode. So it's just for testing purposes. But we have our application executed on the chain. This is the application reference. And the, the ABI is returning that this method succeeded. We can inspect with the duck flow the transaction. Here we are. What was it? Well, it was an application call, part of a group. This application call was executed with an on-competition opt-in. And we can also see here the local state data, which is the how the state changed for that specific account. So for that user, we had a balance key, which changed to one algo here. Very cool stuff. We can also inspect the group of transactions. And indeed, it was a group of two transactions where the first transaction was a payment transaction from the user to the smart contract. And the second transaction was an application call. All right, so we now have a deposit succeeded. We can inspect using the getter method, the balance of our account. We can do that using Again, the method command line uh, um, common. We are passing the application ID. We have the method, which is now um, the get balance method, taking as argument a simple account and returning a value. So here, here we are getting a value in return. The single argument of this method will be the account we just used to send the payment transaction to our smart contract. And we are also sending the transaction from the same account. We execute it on chain and voila. So the, the execution has succeeded. And here we have something very new. So here is very one of the biggest things of ABI because we are getting the result decoded directly from the, uh, from the command line. We don't need to care about encoding or decoding of data types. So here was easy because it was just a simple UN64, but imagine here we have, I don't know, static arrays or named tuples could be very, very challenging for the encoding and decoding. But here the command line is taking care of it as, as the command line also the SDKs will do the same job for us. We can also expect that transaction on the blockchain, sorry. What was an application call again from this sender? with this art, and here we have the logs. As you can see, the logs are encoded on chain, but the command line took care about the decoding part for us. So finally, I want to show you also the withdrawal. The withdrawal again has two arguments, the amount, which is an UN64 and a recipient. Let's take a look at it. I have a method for that. 
we have here the command for calling that method. We have the withdrawal taking a UN64, an account, and return on void. So basically, we are withdrawing 0.25 algos from the balance of transaction sender to account two. Here, the transaction sender corresponds to account two. So we will just withdraw in from the account two balance. Interesting stuff. Here we have fees set to two, so double, just because we want to cover the fees for the inner transaction into the withdrawal method. The inner transaction will indeed process the payment toward the, the user we pass set and up. We executed. Method successed. We inspect this transaction with that flow. And here we are, it's an application call, no, no phone completion. And the local state for the user changed now and has been decreased. Now the, the balance on the local state of the user is uh, 0.75 algos. Interesting of that flow is that that flow also shows in a method that triggers uh, inner transactions, the effects of that method. So the actually the inner transactions that has been uh, triggered by the method. Here, for example, we have the payment transaction from the smart contract to the user, which was also the user code here. And we can inspect this transaction. And indeed, what is a, a payment transaction of 0.25 algos. So, we can also inspect again using the get balance from the user. And here we are, we have the correct result here because we just withdrew 0.25 and this is the remaining balance on the user. So all good. Last thing I want to show you about that flow, which is very interesting. So we have applications here. Now we have only just one application. We can inspect this application, which has a creator, an application address. And here, that flow also offers us the possibility to upload in the application binary interface. So if you remember, with the router, we had the chance to compile and generate the application binary interface. So we can give it to the dub flow. I will upload it, the file here. Here we have the JSON of the AlgoBank application loaded here, and here we are, bam. We now have the, all the methods showing into the dub flow environment. Here we have a deposit method for this application with ID one. And for each method, we have the arguments required, the type of the argument, the description, and also the return value. Same for balance. And withdraw. So imagine now that this application was deployed on the blockchain and the developers of the blockchain just uploaded the API here. If you are a client application and you want to use it, you just use that flow, inspect the API of that application, and you are ready to go for building your client. So this is almost done for the demo part. I will just leave one slide. We have one slide left, which is that one. So we are used to build on Python for the algorithm contract. And it's just a recommendation, but as Matteo said, there are plenty of tools you can use for building smart contracts. Um, we, we are used to work with the PyCharm or, or VS Code with the Algodia plugin. Algodia is just a plugin that integrates with PyCharm and it helps you to build transactions, submit application calls, or just initialize new projects for smart contracts, smart signature, and so on. Then we have the Docker with the Algorand Sandbox tool, and we have seen how useful is that for building and testing smart contracts. Of course, we have the Python SDK for interacting with, uh, with smart contracts, and uh, PyTeal for building, creating smart contracts, and Beaker. We will see Beaker in the next section, and it's like a tool for implementing smart contract uh, in an easier way. Also, this speaker is built on top of PyTL. And last two, we have PyTest, 
I think it's quite useful because with PyTest, you can integrate unit tests to the smart contract and check all the edge cases of the execution for a specific method of your smart contract. And finally, with the till debugger, you can use a tool, the till debugger, for inspecting the execution of the till code line by line and see where the problems are on your smart contract. I think I will stop here and now we can take some questions now. Okay, question. there is a, one question. Yeah. Okay. So in the example we have seen before, we had uh, an ABI interface showing where the smart contract was deployed. So a smart contract is like a piece of software, and you can deploy that smart contract on any network you want. For example, in my demo, I deployed my smart contract on the test local test that I'm running on my machine, but the same code could be deployed also on mainnet or on testnet or algorithm. So using the same JSON file, we can say, hey guys, this is the JSON file, and you can find the application either on the mainnet or on the testnet if you want to test it. And when it's on testnet, you have different application IDs that you can reference on your clients for the test parts and for the production part. So this is the, the reason why we have multiple networks there. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, I think we can stop here and start with the next lecture at half past five. Okay, thank you. Thank you.